This podcast is brought to you from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Welcome to episode 65 of the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name is Jonathan Wiley, and here with me today is Mindy Carney. Hi. How are you doing, Mindy? Good. How are you? Not too bad. Yeah. Big day today. Big day today. We have a, okay, so we have um, Leslie Fisher's coming on the podcast today. Surprise guest. I believe there were some tweets about this, right? I requested Ryan Gosling. Yes. But I am actually more thrilled to have Leslie Fisher. Oh, me too. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have nothing to say to Ryan Gosling. Well, I don't really either. I'd probably be like, um, hi. But there was other Ryans as well. Ryan Reynolds yes. was on there for yes, a while. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, and Ryan Seacrest. Right. Mm-hmm. And Ryan from Ryan and Brian. And Ryan from Ryan and Brian. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot think, of Ryans right? out Wasn't there. Wasn't there something in there from that? Yeah. Yes, right. News and follow-up? Yeah, okay, let's jump in before okay. we talk to Leslie. Okay, sounds good. And first oh, yeah. thing I have on the list yeah. here is some Apple stuff because yeah. there was an Apple event recently that you may or may not have heard something about. But right, I did. Yeah, they're kind of big things yeah and there's a new ipad which may be something interesting for schools absolutely but um i wouldn't get too excited about it necessarily okay. <laughs> because i love your honesty yeah i mean this one is basically exactly the same as the last one yeah except it's got a 10.2 inch screen okay up from 9.7 and it also supports the smart keyboard okay but everything else is the same it's, but the it's same. also a good price and it's the price is the same too. Yeah, right. Yeah, but so it's two ninety nine for schools, which is a good price. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the same processor, it's the same um, materials, it's the same everything else basically, yeah. same software. Yeah, and the iPhone eleven came out. And the iPhone eleven came yeah. out, which is pleasing for Mindy. It is. I um, thought I had an iPhone eight, and then my son tells me yesterday, "No, mom, you have an iPhone 7. So I looked it up while I was talking to Wiley before we went on the air, and I'm like, "It's time. It's time." I'm yeah. ready anyway. There's a few generations in there that have passed you by. A few, yeah. And I am I have always um, missed out on having that nice camera that the iPhone has. I always feel like everybody has all these really nice pictures, and I the camera on the iPhone 7 is not fantastic. So that's what I'm really going for. So you will have two cameras on your next phone. Right? So yes. Well, and Tate said to me, that's my son, um, Mom, are you getting the one with three cameras? And I'm like, whoa, that that iPhone <laughs> One to three is, like is, is a lot. hundred dollars or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, normal lens and a telephoto lens. Yeah, so, I don't. There yeah. you go. I'll have to play with that. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go from. Yeah, I'm not gonna use it. And use and be follow fun to up play. on the next episode. Has Mindy got her new phone? Yeah, we'll and see. Has she taken any pictures with it yet? Yeah, I got to figure out how to get one first. But yeah, that's the plan. Um, and to go alongside those, iOS 13 is being released on September 19th, which yeah. is only a couple of days away as we record. Yeah. Have you gotten it? Sometimes you get in on the early release of this. So have you been in on it? Yes, I can have you, Do you have a sign in blood? Can you talk about it or not talk about it? Yeah, I can talk about it. Right. I mean, there's it, it works. It's fine. It's pretty stable. <laughs> it stab works. Stable. Good. Okay. Yeah, there's new features and things to play with. I like um, things on my phone, for instance. I like uh, there's a new CarPlay. Do okay. you have CarPlay on yeah. your yeah. on your car? Yeah. So there's there's a new layout for CarPlay where you can see things like um, the map as well as like uh, your music or the podcast thing at the same time on the same screen. So like a really? multi view. Yep. And like if you summon Siri, um, it doesn't like take over the whole screen. It just appears on top of whatever it is you're already looking at. Huh. And the one thing that always gets us when we're on road trips is like um, besides your driving. Yeah, beside my driving, mm -hmm. <laughs> if if I wanted to use my wife's phone and yeah. it was already connected to CarPlay, you press the button and it takes you out of CarPlay into oh. whatever you're using. But okay. not now, it stays inside of CarPlay, even if you're in a different app. Like you just want to oh. check messages or something yeah. that came through or email or something huh. like that. Is your um, wife an iPhone user? She is. She has an iPhone 7, oh, like yeah. you. Oh, that's right. I knew that. She's also that. looking at new phones. I, I bet she is. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Right. Okay. So could be a double update there. Yeah, sure. Uh, the iPad, interestingly, though, has its own operating system this year, and what? that doesn't come out until September 30th. Really? Yes. That's I unusual, isn't it? That is a first. Yeah. iPad OS. Yes. iPad OS. So is this something that we're going to expect from Apple now? They're going to start doing separate 
that seems to be the way. Yeah. I mean, it looks a lot like the iPad software before, yeah. but it's just got some extra things that mm. they're saying the iPhone's not going to get this, but the oh. iPad does. So, for mm. instance, uh, Safari now yeah. is kind of like... Who uses a, Safari besides you? On the iPad? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think I like it a lot, but yeah. um, it's now got... It's, it's like a desktop browser. Okay. So, like, if you went to Google Docs, you see it like it would be on a Chrome browser on your Mac. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if you went to YouTube, oh. you don't get the mobile site version, basically, or it yeah. doesn't kick oh. you out to an app. Mm -hmm. You can do all those things. That's nice. And a full... So can browser. you edit like in a Google Doc? Yes. Really? You can. And, and it, it's nice. Yes. And it works mm, pretty well. I'm going to believe it when I see it. Okay. Test okay. it out. I will. September 30th for iPadOS. Okay. Well, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, this I was not as excited about, but apparently um, Lynn Kleinmeier was over the moon about is the word count in Google Docs. Yes. Who cares? Well, I think a lot of people <laughs> care. I know. I, that's why I'm wondering, like, what... Why? Why? What? Why? Uh -huh. Why? <laughs> I'm just curious about what situation that that matters. But I mean, you must have been in a scenario where you've been told to write 500 words or 1,500 words oh God, or something. Are we still doing that in education, though? Oh yeah. You think we are? Even you, you've, I did that in my in like my master's degree when yeah. I just did that. They're like, yeah, it has to be this minimum word count and stuff. And so yeah, it's it has a live word count in the corner of your screen that you can check on if you want it it doesn't have to be there yeah Ugh. it's under the tools yeah menu. which i there like you had said there are plenty of kids out there rejoicing i'm sure so yeah. it's nice and easy yeah all right what else well there's other google things um okay inside of google slides now your your favorite google tool mm -hmm. uh there's two shortcut keys i don't know if you saw this b yeah. and w Okay. So when you're presenting yeah. and you tap B on your keyboard, it turns your slide black. And oh. if you tap W, it turns your slide white. Okay. So it's for one of those for transitions, types. you mean? Like as you're... Not a transition. No. Like oh. maybe you want to have a, a conversation about oh. something and you just wanted to blank out the whole slide. So Like my people... 80s gifts are too distracting, so I have to... I would say that kind of idea, yeah, yes. I'm... Or maybe you had... Um, I don't know, an explanation of something up on the board and you taught it and you didn't want it to be there as a prompt for kids mm -hmm. to, you know, refer back to for whatever reason. You could right. black it out or white it out. Okay. Yes. And you can also um, loop and set auto advance times for presentation mode. In presentation mode? You so can... when you go into presentation mode, you can click on the gear icon and then you can okay. choose loop oh. and then it will just play and loop through. Okay. And you know, you could do that before if you got like right. the embed code publish. and right. you publish yep. to the web, but then you'd yep. have to embed it on a something yeah. in order for that to happen. You can just do it without publishing to the web now. Well, you didn't have to, Im you didn't have to embed it to get the loop. You just had to share the published web link. It didn't have to be embedded for your... Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those are just your settings when you go into publish. Yep. Right. Yep. So now you can set that like as you're presenting. Yes, right. and without okay. presenting right. to the web and that okay. kind of thing too. So, hmm. so a couple yeah. of little things. Okay, all right. And there's also, I saw a video because we talked about the rubrics in Google Classroom recently. We did. And that beta that you could sign up yeah. for. Yeah, which you... I, <laughs> yeah. I signed up for yeah. it. You're like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> it came back in an hour and said, you're in. And I went, oh, all right. <laughs> now what? Um, but Richard Byrne has a video, um, mm -hmm. a walkthrough video of what that's like. And um, okay. I thought I'd add a link to that if you want to see it. Sure. Interestingly, he said uh, the kind of the drawback to it is that you can't reuse an old rubric. What? So well, you have to do. Come on, Google. You have for to real. do all your rubrics from scratch right now. Anyway, it's in beta, so hopefully okay. that's feedback they get. But you know, okay. if you're doing like a, I don't know, rewriting an essay and you've got the same type of grammatical things you want from people, or the same yeah. type of sentence structures and things you're looking for that. Yeah, you have to type all that out from scratch. That's dumb. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be nice, too, if you could, like, at least import it or something. You know what I mean? Like, just attach the doc you've already created, and it just imports it all in would be nice. That would be good. So, Google, since we know you're listening, <laughs> that's dumb. <laughs> made, we've made Fix such it. a big dent on their stuff in the past. Yes, so. truly we have. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's good to know. What else? International Podcast Day is coming yeah. up. Yeah. 
couple of weeks. We'll take any suggestions. So right now we're trying to come up with a topic for that day. Yeah. Anybody have a suggestion? Do a bonus episode on yeah, September 30th. Yeah, send us some ideas because we're, we're both super busy. And so we're like, oh, what will we do? What I will had, we do? I had an idea, but maybe no, shut, I shut it, shut it down. down. I know. Well, because... Can I share what you wanted to do? Sure. All right. So Wiley wanted to do um, a Tech Nugget Day. And I said, we have to save that for National Nugget Day. Everyone agrees with me. If you want a Nugget Day on September 30th, Nugget days are hard. Let us know. Tweet at Team Carney on Twitter and tell her that you want the nugs. Well, you can tweet all you want. (laughs) (laughs) Not going to make a difference. All right. No, those Nugget Days require, they do require some serious prep. They do require some prep. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So I think one Nugget Day a year is plenty, but whatever, fine. If everyone clamors for a Nugget Day, I'll give in. Mm -hmm. But I won't be happy about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it will be an unhappy nugget day. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so that's coming up September 30th. So hopefully we'll get one released on that day. Um, oh, you've got one more thing on here that we skipped. I think I skipped it. I'm sorry. Wonderopolis, an immersive reader. Yes. Did you want to talk about that? Um, sure. I mean, okay. um, Wonderopolis have teamed up with Microsoft. They've integrated the immersive reader tool that is in OneNote and Flipgrid and mm-hmm. some other things. Great. So it's just a, a nice accessibility option for people who might want to have um, the Wonderopolis articles read aloud and Mm -hmm. to take advantage of those features and things that are inside the Immersive Reader. Yeah, and I don't know anything about Immersive Reader at all, I don't think. I'm sure I should. No. Uh, So it lets you change the font, the font size, the font spacing, and it lets you change the background colors. It will do things like highlight all the nouns. And so all of those tools now are built into Wonderopolis, the website itself. Got it. Okay. You can set it so that it does like, um, I don't know, you used to have these cards and things that kids would use that were highlighted one line at yeah. a time as a card yeah. with a hole in yeah. it or something. Mm-hmm. And team, so it'll do that and you can choose how much it, it shows at one time. Like to a help shade of sorts or something, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Nice. So, nice tools to have. Yeah. Hopefully that continues. It's always good to see that kind of stuff. It's nice to see tools smashing together. There's a lot right? more of that right yeah, now. Yeah, there is. There? Yeah. Wakelet's doing a lot of that yeah. too. I mean, we've talked a lot about how there's just, I mean, people always want to know about what's new and what's it, but I feel like there's less of that, but the tools that we've come to rely on are getting better because of those integrations. I agree. Right? Okay. Work for the common Which is why good. Tech Nuggets is so hard these days, it seems like. Yes. <laughs> All right, so up next, our main course, we have a special guest today. Leslie Fisher is joining us on the podcast. We're so excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Hi, guys. How are you? So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about Wiley said something like, oh, we should ask her about her origin story. I'm sure she's a Star Wars, you know, watcher. Superheroes. Superheroes, the Avengers. What is your origin story? Can you tell us? So thank you for asking. Uh, I I have an interesting way that I ended up in ed tech. And even when I was in college, I never thought I'd end up in ed tech. I, um, first, let me say, I did not enjoy a moment of school. Uh, I, I turns out I, I struggle a lot with reading, with taking in a lot of content. And that, that really just was an issue for me all for school. And, and it really wasn't even diagnosed until college. And even then it was slightly misdiagnosed. And I learned that in April. So, so we'll put, we'll put that aside and then, and then we'll, we'll talk about the rest. I was a music major because that was one thing I did well all through school. I was actually a really good musician. I sang, I could read music really well. It made sense to me to read music when it, when reading words didn't make sense to me. Uh, and so I was kind of out of anything. I was like, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to be a professional musician? I don't want to audition for stuff, but I can't do anything else better. And and so that's really what the, the path I thought I was on. My junior year of college, I was interning in a recording studio and there was a Macintosh that was controlling an entire string section uh, using something known as SMPTE. And I got really curious about how this technology was playing a role in music. And so I began to dig more and more into it. My mom had a Mac, so I started tinkering with her Mac. 
And she said, stop tinkering with my Mac. If you really like this thing, go and get your own. And, <laughs> um, and it was so funny because that sounds like a pretty daunting thing. And I remember walking onto the USC campus during their back to school sale. And there was this huge Apple set up. And I was asking, I guess, way too many questions because I was offered a job right on the spot to be a USC student rep. Nice. And it turned out I was talking to the Apple representative for USC and she really wanted a female student rep. So she goes, I can only pay you five bucks an hour. You're going to be doing anything from running price lists to different offices to talking and answering questions from students. I can only give you five bucks an hour, but you get a free computer every year. So my mom always loves the fact that I came back with not only a Mac, I came back with a job. Yeah, yeah. right. So, <laughs> and, and that really changed my focus because I began to see this world of technology. And, and at then it wasn't even assistive technology. If we think about it, it was simply a computer. But I saw this computer and, I, and I, I got really fascinated with it and realized that I wanted to pursue it professionally. So I dropped out of the music school. Uh, there really wasn't a geeky major at the time and got a communications and business major and went straight to Apple. So uh, it was in college that I was diagnosed as, as being dyslexic. Um, in April, I was diagnosed with a vision problem, which is called binocular vision dysfunction, which means the more content that surrounds me, the more that I struggle with said content. And that really makes a lot of sense about why I, I don't do well in um, reading a lot of text that's pushed together, but music, when it's on a single line, I can read. Sure. And so it, it became super fascinating when I had this diagnosis of, all the struggles that I still have and, and I, I, I had back then and why part of it is probably because I'm slightly dyslexic, but also because simply my eyes aren't working as they should. So really the reason how I ended up doing what I'm doing was my time at Apple. I was doing a lot of presentations. I was a systems engineer in K-12 education. I would present about Apple technology. I was laid off in 97. I actually attended a conference as an attendee on web development. And it was a conference I knew from my education time and the presenter never showed up. The conference coordinator said, hey, saw me in the audience and said, can I have you teach this class? So I actually taught an advanced web development class that I paid to attend. Oh. And I, I taught it. And it was a conference called Classroom Connect, for those of you that have been around for a while. And they said, you know, we go to eight different places in the country. Would you want to do this? And so I thought, you know, while I kind of take some time off and let my Apple severance package pay the bills, I'll do these. And not knowing that there were conference buys and, and not knowing that um, other conferences check out other conferences. And that's where I started getting approached to do all the different statewide conferences. And, and one conference loved me so much, they sent it out to, at the time, a mailing list of all educational technology conference coordinators. And ISTE found out about me, and that was 22 years ago. Oh, wow. And what really was a boom goes a dynamite for me, because back in my early days of conference presenting, it was very much web development, digital photography. The boom goes the dynamite was a two-parter. One was web 2.0 because all of a sudden we had these interactive sites that web meant so much more that um, we needed to have some guidance through. But the personal boom goes to dynamite for me was the iPhone, because all of a sudden now I had maybe five, six or seven different apps that did the same thing. And I could adjust it to my learning style and to what made sense to me. So one app that I might struggle with because all of the content being as it is, and there another app that I was fine with. And that's when I really realized, hold on, I get to talk to educators for a living Maybe I can try to talk to them what I think are some of the most engaging technology that's the easiest to implement. So if they have five different versions of me in their class, it's not going to be a daunting task to try to implement five different ways to get the same thing done and embrace what we now call individual learning. And so for me, education, would uh, my time in school would have been really interesting if, if we had mobile technology. I don't know how much of a whole learner I would be because I think I would have been addicted to the device. Mm -hmm. But it really has become kind of like my my honor uh, to be able to help educators navigate what I think are some of the most engaging technologies out there for students that are easy to implement for the teacher. And along the way, it's been really interesting to identify um, kind of the things that, that kind of caught me up along the way and why it's shaped and made me the presenter who I am. That's really interesting. It yeah. is interesting, yeah. yeah. I feel like we're we're on a, in a kind of a, a microclimate now where I'm, I'm going to pick up on something you just said about your your learning difficulties and things that the assistive technologies and all the, the AT tools that are coming out now are really um, becoming a lot more powerful. And there's there's great stuff out there, isn't there? So what, what kind of things do you enjoy seeing? 
Um, well, first of all, I mean, the first thing anytime a new operating system comes out, I go straight to the accessibility features because that's yeah. some of the coolest features out there. Right. I mean, if we look at, we got iOS 3 coming out in two days. And if you look at the assistive features in there, one of them is voice control where you can, where you can literally send text messages like you can never before, open up apps like you, you never could before. And I learned an interesting stat that a lot of times if you design for one, uh, the greater good will benefit from it. And, and so... I love all the assistive stuff that's coming out because it's it's putting focus on a group that that has needed focus honestly before us, and it's also helping us in 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 the time as well. So probably one of the biggie ones for me is Microsoft's Immersive Reader, which is one I discovered last year. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, mm -hmm. but it lets me take any text and put it into it's BYOD happy and. It will let me change the size of the text, the font, the background color, highlight adjectives, ner uh, nouns, verbs. There's a picture dictionary, so I can click on it and up will pop up a picture of the item. I could click and hear the audio of that word, and then I can click and hear the entire thing read to me, and then I could change its language. So not only do we have a solution for someone who might be ESL, we also have a solution for someone who's a struggling, a struggling learner. And I... I love doing this for a bit of the wow factor. I, I can understand why teachers are teachers because when they show something to a student and they get that look and the light bulb goes off and that student's engaged, I think it's one of the best feelings out there. It really is. And, and so I like to get that from a teacher. And so I do look for those things that will just make their brain explode. And for mm -hmm. the past year, I've been showing Immersive Reader and to look at, to watch educators' faces when they see it for the first time, to just have them stare at you because you know that it's going to impact a student. And in a lot of cases, it might impact that very teacher or their kids at home or family. It's one of those universal across the board ones. So uh, I mentioned this on, on a different podcast that if you said, I'd, if you told me a year and a half ago, I'd say the word Microsoft, I'd go, did I lose a bet? What yeah. happened? <laughs> um, but, but they're doing some amazing things in, in the idea of inclusion. And if you talk to them, they'll say it's all about inclusion. And I really think we're getting to a point where where technology is beginning to level. We, we don't see these amazing releases anymore. We don't see these things where we all stop and we like, can you believe this? They, they might be those little micro moments, but not overall. But when we look at accessibility, that's a completely different story. We're, we're coming out with things in the accessibility department that is just life-changing and groundbreaking for the people that need it and possibly for us. Even, not, I don't, the word even's wrong, but especially if we communicate or we teach with those or we interact with those people that need those tools, it's opening up those, those areas for them. And, and that's so, so exciting. Yeah, and I think part of it is like, you know, expanding our, our definition of accessibility when before we were like, oh, this is only for the, the special educational classrooms and, and things like that, where all kids can benefit from some of these like, you know, text to speech things or, or other tools out there. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, and and I don't I'll, I'll just jump in. Sorry, real quick with this story, because uh, I'm going to say the M word again. But yeah, Microsoft, one of the things if you really want to help out an ed tech presenter is to keep the ed tech presenter educated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> Microsoft does a really good job at, hey, have you heard? And I, I love this. And one of the stories they told me about was uh, in Windows, the two features that Wired gave the top 10 of Two of them came directly from people with accessible needs that said it would really help them. And one of them was the ability to change the size of the cursor and then also change the color of the cursor. So you're not dragging a white cursor into a sea of white, which makes a lot of sense. And then the other one was scrolling text size. Someone was like, I can't do 100. I can't do 90. Please give me 93. And so you can now scroll the text size. So you have a great point that, yeah, absolutely. When we design for those that need a little bit of extra help, it's going to help us as well or we'll learn from it. So it's just such a it's just such a cool it's just such a cool thing. Mm -hmm. So you've talked a little bit about all of the sharing that you um, do and, and Wiley and I have both seen you present. We think you're fantastic. Um, Thank you. I, we both love your pre Thank you. presentation style. So you travel a lot. You go to a lot of different conferences. What would you say are the best ed tech conferences that you've been to? Um, that you would recommend to other teachers who are, you know, looking to spend, you know, their one conference they get to go to every couple of years, where would you send them? And is this like picking your favorite child or, yeah. or not? I was about to say, you took Careful. that Oh, I did. Oh, I'm sorry. As someone, 
And it's okay. It's yeah. fine. As, as someone who gets hired from these conferences, right. they're all fantastic. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but I'll I'll tell you. Here's how. Here's how I would. I would say that is how are you with your level of knowledge and technology? Because I think if the first thing you do is you go into an ISTE, you're going to be drinking from a serious fire hose and you're, you're just going to be Mm -hmm. bombarded and you're probably going to walk out and your brain's going to hurt. I would say, look for one of the uh, ed camp events. I mean, those are awesome, awesome. Start locally, start organically, find an ed camp event at your local state and be part of that. They're not going to be perfect, but they're a lot of fun. And most of the time they're free. And then also, if you say, if someone says to me, I'm thinking about getting into presenting, go to an ed camp, present in an ed camp, see if you like that. So I would say to start at those ed camps. They're super small, but they're customized and they're a lot of fun. And then the next thing I would say is to take a look at your state or your nearby technology conference. And that's really where I would say you should get your your feet wet, so to speak. We are surrounded by such great regional or, or local or statewide conferences. I've been fortunate enough to present at all of them. And that would be the next step. And then I would say, once you do that, and once you have a feel for how these conferences work, then graduate into into the big leagues. So uh, not the big leagues, but just those bigger experiences, because I've found so many educators started a super big conference and and they wish they had that time back. Uh, so I would say, you know, the big three are FETC, TCEA, and ISTE. Those, keep in mind, start at 8,000 attendees and above. So you gotta be, you got to be ready for those. Um, if you want to talk regional, the GAETC conference in Georgia is just a, a fun-loving group of people, um, just fun Southern hospitality. Then you have Michigan, McCall. That's another just amazing conference. And now, once again, it's like picking children because I'm like, <laughs> I, know I'm, I know I'm missing some here. But there's, there's, you know, I would say start small and, and, and work your way up. Um, ISTE is, is like drinking through a fire hose, but you're not going to find more content anywhere. And if you do decide to go to ISTE, and this year it's in Anaheim, so I don't fault anyone that is going to go to the brand new convention center that is literally steps away from Disneyland. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to, to spend part of your summer. And it's your first ISTE, don't kick yourself in the butt if you make some boo-boos along the way, because it is a very large conference to navigate. Mm-hmm. So don't don't feel bad about that. But I really feel like an ISTE should be part of, you need to try to get to like an ISTE, an FETC or TCEA at least once every three years, once every other year. Um, and then a- after that, look at your, your region, your region conferences. We have a lot of, of good ones around and then feel free. I'm sure they reach out to you, but also reach out, you know, they can feel free to reach out to me and say, I live here. What conference would you recommend mm-hmm. for me? Because we're, we're lucky. We're lucky to have so, so many good conferences that all, most of them are also run by passionate educators right. that want to simply get the word out and help teachers, which is, it's just, it's infectious. I mean, it's, it's infectious when, when you're, when you're part of that dynamic. And I'm sure as we keep talking, I'll remember conferences <laughs> I didn't mention and feel bad about. So when you're presenting at uh, conferences, one of the things I, I see you do quite a lot is you'll you'll start introducing a new tool or an app or something, and you'll say, "Raise your hand if this is new to you," and then mm-hmm. you'll know how much detail to go into or or how much not to, and things like that. But what kind of ones are what kind of things are are people most unaware of? What what are like the the best kept secrets that are always getting good bang for the buck when you're showing these things? Well, first of all, I want to explain why I do the hand raise sure. because um, a couple other presenters have uh, has have very politely said, "I've totally now that you've explained the hand raise, I have taken it from you." And I'm like, "I want you to raising your hand first of all engages an audience instead of them just sitting there and you don't know." And I say, "Be brutally honest with me. If you know something, tell me you do or tell me you don't." Because I would feel bad is if you went to a technology conference, paid money, and you didn't. You, you knew every single thing that came out of my mouth. And then also based on the percentages of people that raise their hand, I know where to send my focus. So for example, if I say Flipgrid, how many of you have heard of it? And most of the hands go up, well then I don't need to go over what is Flipgrid. And then I can take those five minutes and instead go over some of my favorite tips and tricks and then say, if you don't know what Flipgrid is, you know, fine, raise your hands again, everyone, look at them, ask for the five minute version or, or look it up. I'm sorry I tossed you under a bus. But it really lets me dial in the type of content that I deliver 
to the audience. Um, and, and so that's why I do that. And it also keeps the audience engaged. And, and so I really appreciate people that are honest because it's, a, it's a really, it's, it's interesting how we struggle with, I'm going to admit that I don't know something. Yeah. And, and we're getting so much better compared to the time that I was, or you guys were in school with that. Now it's almost kind of cool to say, I don't know. And, and anytime I don't know something, I always say, please educate me. And, and it's some of the best three words that come out of my mouth is because I know I'm about to learn something new and that, that might help me and others. Uh, in terms of what's out there, um, I'm going to go back to, I hate to say, I'm going to go back to another Microsoft product and I'm going to say Microsoft Translator because it's one of those that when I show it, people automatically go into the space of Google Translate and there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Google Translate's a great app. Um, Microsoft Translator, though, has a feature in it that lets me as a presenter say, everyone join with this code. And when they join with the code, they select what language they speak. And then I could speak into Translator and then it can broadcast out into AirPods or wherever, or even just text, whatever language they selected. So I could have four different languages in an audience and I could be speaking and it can be delivering in four different languages. And, and when we talk about our, our really awesome melting pots of classrooms that we have now, and it's another thing I just want to say randomly is, if you have kids that speak four different languages in, in your classroom, you have four different learning opportunities about culture. And mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's a great way to include those people is 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 you have right there. You, you actually have a pen pal like sitting right mm -hmm. next to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Me too. So That's what this guy is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we should take better advantage of that. And, and yeah, that, you should. that could be that student's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It could be that student's uniqueness uniqueness for the class is, you know, there's so much you know opportunity there. But you take something like translator and if I, you know, you have three different languages spoken in the class, is it perfect? Oh, heck no. Is it better than nothing? Absolutely. Sure. So I would say um, that would be one of, you know, my favorite little hidden ones. And then the other one, and I start with this all the time. If you see me present, I mention it every year, is Flippity. Mm -hmm. And and Flippity just takes a Google Sheet and it turns it into so many different things. I think 23 different things or something. And when I have a new audience, like, for example, if a school brought me out to do PD or a new conference, I know there's a good chance not a lot of people have heard of it. And when all the hands go up that they haven't heard of it, uh, I'm always like, oh, boy, <laughs> I'm going to win them over. I'm going to win them over just with flippity. And then the last one I'll say, and this one is I'm going to plead guilty to, is going back and looking at, at applications that you thought you knew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And keeping up to date with them. Yeah. And this one I'm going to plead so guilty with. That I assume, and you know what they say about assuming, you assume that you know everything that's in the feature set, and then you go back and look at it three months later, you know, these guys have to make money somehow, and <laughs> they make money by okay. updating. And so, for example, Kahoot, Kahoot, I think everyone knows, and I say to people jokingly, have you been Kahooted lately? Don't worry, I won't Kahoot you. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll go into some of their newer features, and people are absolutely unaware that those features exist, so... I always go back and, and take a look and, and see if there's something new. And these companies do a really good job of just throwing it at you right on the intro screen of what's new. Mm -hmm. So um, the last time I saw you present, I think it was at ISTE when we were in Chicago, I think. Chicago! Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, you were sharing a lot of AR, VR stuff. And we've done a lot of AR, VR stuff here at the agency with our teachers. And I've always kind of struggled as far as... Um, just the real critical thinking portions of AR, VR, but because you're usually on the cutting edge of that, where do you see the future of AR, VR going? What's something that you think is really going to stick around and be beneficial to students and teachers? Well, I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way, but I'm happy that you're struggling with AR, yeah. VR because, because, yeah, because there's a lot of reasons why. And one of them is I'm not a fan of when AR, VR completely takes away the teacher's voice. And so in, in the role that you guys are in, some AR VR is so immersive, it's supposed to be the off goes the kid and then the teacher really becomes not even a guide on the side. They're, you know, they could be there. I mean, I have so many selfies with me, someone with a VR headset, and they don't know I'm taking a selfie because <laughs> they're so immersed. <laughs> right. and, and I know there's a good reason for that in some VR, but, but I can understand how that kind of takes away the teacher voice. And then the other thing is the digital divide. And I think that's the big struggle that we're gonna have and we're going to continue to have with AR and VR. We need a mobile device. How many kids are coming in with a mobile device? Oh, then we can share the mobile devices. Good luck sharing a brand spanking new iPhone with another kid. Most kids are gonna go keep your paws off yeah, the phone. Right. So we, we could come in with the best of intentions of that, but it's going to kind of get messy. So yeah, we're going to keep seeing this. 
And I don't really think there's much we can do about it until time passes a little bit. And I think as time passes more and more, I think we're going to start seeing, you know, augment AR and VR become more commonplace. And then also the devices, for example, Chromebooks with front and rear cameras right. that run Android will, will fill the gap. So I would think uh, one of my favorite, because it's got to be real world educational. Um, and I think one of the, the newer ones that I'm such a big fan of is the augmented reality and Flipgrid, because it lets you guys just give such an easy example of what is augmented reality. And... If, if you guys haven't seen it or the audience hasn't seen it, you can now take any reply in Flipgrid and then run the Flipgrid app and then point to a QR code and up pops a reply in augmented reality. So I have seen teachers make little cuts, cutouts of their students and they're all holding their little augmented reality Flipgrid code and another student can go and point it and up pops the student introducing themselves. So... Uh, I think we probably are familiar with something that used to be called Erasmus mm -hmm. that's now called HP Reveal. And, and Flipgrid a lot will talk about the student voice side of it. And, and I'm looking at this augmented reality tool in Flipgrid and I'm saying, but this could be a teacher voice tool. This could be a teacher could sit there and put together all of these little clips of video for students for work that they're going to do on their own or even encouragement. I mean, that's one of the things, like, could you imagine a bunch of AR codes where you say, do you need a pick me up? Point to this. And all of a sudden your <laughs> teacher pops up with words of encouragement. And, and so I really think that the Flipgrid AR feature has, has the ability to kind of take over what we were used to, well, and still are used to HP reveal being. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I'm also a big fan of any augmented reality that lets you relive or be somewhere that you can't be. So for example, uh, Moonshot, if you haven't seen Moonshot, gorgeous augmented reality app of, of the NASA uh, mission. And then there, the Statue of Liberty, they released an augmented reality app that serves if you're at the Statue of Liberty, it has one layer of augmented mm -hmm. reality. And if you're not, it has a completely different one. Mm -hmm. So things that recreate things that when when you can't be there. And then... Of course, merge the merge cube, uh, which, you know, I got to I got to give a, a shout out to merge because two years ago, they were a company that had a square squishy cube for entertainment and it had some education apps. And then when educators went running to Walmarts because they were a dollar each and cleared <laughs> them out, they almost overnight said, well, OK, we're an education company. And they're, they look like a completely different company than they did a couple of years ago. They now have an education app. They have lesson plans. They're taking some of the apps that they used to consider uh, entertainment apps and putting an education feel on them. And I've always liked the Merge Cube because it's that tactile play, that idea that you're holding something in your hand. And while you could sit there and go, but their original apps didn't do too much in the education space, I'm okay with that because it's the same reason that you said you're struggling with AR. Any teacher can make something teachable if you have an engaged student. Mm -hmm. And and that's another thing that makes teachers so awesome uh, is you can take pretty much anything. And even if it doesn't have a lesson plan assigned to it, you show a teacher an engaged student um, and that that teacher is going to make a lesson plan around that. And then the other thing that I'm super excited about is the self-contained headset. And I think that's really going to be the boom goes the dynamite uh, when we when we have these headsets that don't need to just slide a phone into them. So the Oculus Quest is uh, just a gorgeous headset and it's a gorgeous price point. It is Facebook dependent, of course, so that that brings in some issues. But I think we're beginning to see where we're going to go with this. And, and, and I like the idea of having a school or even a district have one or two carts, which are 30 headsets that can roll into a classroom that all of a sudden then becomes that virtual reality class. And those students don't need those mobile devices to do that. And I really think that's going to help us down the line. But that line probably is what I would say anywhere from one to three years out where we can say it's not dependent upon an architecture. So. So I see your iPhone there. Are you getting the new iPhone 11? Is that it? Yes. That's not it. You don't have like no. a special like, OK. Wouldn't that be great? Be. <laughs> and I need to say this because everyone it's so funny that people think like, wow, you must get everything free and ahead of time. No, 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 and no. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that if I, well, first of all, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I don't rank enough to, to get that stuff for free. And even if, if I did, part of me wants to feel like, no, I need to be, I need to be buying this stuff. I need to be talking to these companies to, 
It's like, I don't know if you saw that tweet about, I mean, I got a June oven, which is an intelligent oven. It's like, oh it's an oven with a camera. Oh, oh, like a Wi-Fi oven, oven, oven or a, something? No. no. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's address the okay. iPhone and then sure. I'll come back to, to the oven. Uh, Last year, I moved to the next plan. I'm an at t yep. user, so I moved to the next plan, which means every month I spend the money and every year I get a new nice. phone. I, I'm i lucky that this is a business expense for me, so I have that going for me. It's a tax deduction for me, so I have that going for me. So I can understand how someone else would hear like 60 bucks a month for the top of the line phone and go, you're crazy. And, and I get it, but for me, it's a business expense. So this was the easiest pain-free iPhone ordering. I had to pay like one extra month of the, the the phone because it was not, you have to have six months of payments and it wasn't there yet. It cost me like a hundred dollars could include it to move to the new phone. So you bet your butt. Uh, this will be, I'll be here on Friday. I'm going to be looking outside at the, for the little FedEx or UPS truck and planning my bathroom runs accordingly. And I, I can't wait. It's it's a really minor, minor upgrade on the iPhone 11. The biggie for me is going to be the video feature. Mm -hmm. The fact that, I don't know if you saw the keynote where you can film the front and the back camera at the same time. I just thought that's cool. Mm -hmm. So Leslie, without the next plan, probably would have waited. But I, I so would rather give 60 bucks a month and get a new phone every year than it's going to cost me how much? That just yeah, hurt. Right. So... Uh, if you can afford the money, and, and remember, 60 bucks is like the highest iPhone 11, max, biggest, you know, it's it gets cheaper. It gets into the 20, 30 range. This was a pain, this was a painless upgrade. And I'm impatiently waiting for that phone to tinker with the video. But OK, so now let's go back to the gadget thing, because because it's just a perfect example. I don't cook. I toast. I've had my toaster 10 okay. years and it was one click away from being like a fire hazard. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I so I, I went on, I went on to my, my virtual family and said, Hey, uh, family, what would you recommend? And, and I, I've been thinking of an air fryer and they're like, Oh, get the June oven. So one person said June oven. I go and look, it's an intelligent oven. It actually has a high definition camera in the oven. <laughs> so you slide in like a steak and we'll go, this is a steak. Yeah, it's a steak. Um, how uh, do you want it? What do you want? Uh, medium rare. And so you put the temperature probe in and it does its thing. Put potatoes in. Oh, these are potatoes. Okay, I got it. No way. And so it will actually, it'll go from like sear, broil, bake mode. Like when it cooks a steak, it like changes all the modes uh, That's awesome. that you have. It is so freakishly <laughs> awesome. And then you control everything from an app. So I am I have the app. I'm like, oh, preheat my oven. And then when it's cooking, you can watch it cook live from your <laughs> oven. And then you can make a time lapse when it's all, all said and done. And um, it is a hoot. And, and I love the thing. I'm cooking like, and I show in my gadgets presentation, I show like a steak cooking. And I would never, if you told, once again, you told me a year ago that I'd cook a steak at my home. I'm like, well, who did I hire? <laughs> or who am I dating? What's he look like? <laughs> um, so, um, and so I'm just amazed that I'm doing that. So this is an oven that I, I spent the money just like everyone else did. I would have never gone to June and said, hey, June, I, I'm an engine. Give me an oven. I just, it's just not, it's not in my, I, I would never, ever <laughs> do that. So I spent the money just like everyone else. And, and my Facebook family, people were like, so how much are they paying you? I'm like, no, I'm just a fan. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that I, I, I feel like, you know, I should, I should be make paying the bills and all of that. And so, yeah, the June oven, but I got to let you know it's expensive. It's like they just raised the price. I think it's like 600 or 700 bucks, but um, but it's like having I, your own like chef of sorts, right? Yeah, like you just like mix this stuff yeah. and toss and it in. If, and every week they come out with new recipes. Oh. So there's like a little recipe guide. And then they also come out with new identifiers. So for example, they just added an identifier for taquitos. If you have frozen taquitos, it'll know taquitos. And and so they just added grilled cheese sandwich uh, because people are like, we, we demand grilled cheese. Mm -hmm. So they had to figure out a way to make a grilled cheese recipe. And it knows all the steps to make grilled cheese. So... So every week your oven's giving you like a little <laughs> gift and it updates itself and the whole, I mean, it's like, if you're a tech geek, it's, yeah, this is like, this thing's like awesome. the ultimate so, tech so geek accessory in your home, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially for me who I'm on the road sometimes up to 200 days a year. I might be home for three or four days. So I really don't keep a very stock sure. refrigerator of anything but soda. And so it's, it's really nice in the morning to go, you know what? I feel like cooking a steak and then you can just get your items and you, 
I've never been able to cook as effectively as this thing can. It, it just, I mean, it's awesome. So I probably cost you or some of the people watching this podcast some money. <laughs> I know I've cost my Facebook friends and attendees some money. All I can say is I'm sorry, but the thing is pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> awesome. Leslie, it was great to speak to you today. Um, where can people see you this year or, or find out more information about you? What do you want to plug? <laughs> <laughs> well, my website's my name, simply lesliefisher.com. Feel free to find me there. I am on Facebook and Twitter. I don't really, I don't hyper tweet. I don't hyper post on Facebook. I try to share one little tidbit a day. So I try not to be too annoying. Uh, I am going to do a couple webinars maybe. Um, I'm signed up for all the biggie conferences, which always warms my heart. So you will see me at FETC, TCEA, I, ISTE. The approval hasn't come through yet, but I know Microsoft is going to have me there. So I'll be with Microsoft. And that's a new little wrinkle. If you're going to be at FETC, TCEA, or ISTE, I will be helping Microsoft out. I will be doing booth presentations and I will be doing um, presentations in their learning room. Uh, McCall, I'm going to be at, I'm going to be at GAETC. Um, I'm going to be next month. It's going to be the Oklahoma Technology Conference and, um, oh, Le Oh, Le I'm going back to Louisiana, which is just, you know, that conference is seriously heartwarming for me. You just mentioned all those conferences that you forgot about mentioning earlier. You know, all your <laughs> so favorite you children. you gave your chance. Yeah, there you go. We got Redeemed them in. Yourself. And, and, yeah. And then let me, let me give a shout out for one that it's very specific, but uh, I've been part of it and I've been, it's, it's been interesting. It's a conference called LRP. And it's an offshoot of FETC, and it is for administrators. It's very specific, but it's administrators that ha need to handle the legal needs mm. of education with a highlight on special education. Hmm. And one of the things they added is they added the technology strand. And so I'm, I'm part of that technology strand. And last year, they teamed me up with a lawyer. So I got to be me and talk about the things I love. And then the lawyer just burned yeah. down all my shares <laughs> and dreams. Mm -hmm. All the terms and conditions <laughs> and came out and all the fine print I, yeah. reading. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> I was scared to like say anything. Like my next presentation, I was on my, on my own. I'm like, I'm scared to stay my yeah. Um But it's, it's one of those that as we talk about this area of inclusion, um, because there's a lot of administrators at this conference, you do get a lot of those companies or whatnot that are part of it. So, uh, it's in New Orleans mm -hmm. uh, in May this year. So that's where that's where you can find me. But I really try to be as findable as possible. My direct message on Twitter is open. Uh, it's funny. If you look at uh, look for me on Twitter, it looks like I'm only following a couple people. But once again, I can't handle a lot of content. So I have everything in Twitter lists, mm -hmm. which make my research a lot easier on my, my brain. But my direct message is open so people can feel free to send a hello there. Um, we're all in this together. If it were... If we can all learn and teach together, it's going to do nothing but probably help each other and help help the students that, that the, the, the teachers I present to mm -hmm. have in their classes. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So up next, my favorite part of the show is Tech Nuggets. There's always a big pause there, isn't there? I know. We kind of look at each other like, mm -hmm. who's going? Well, your nuggets are first, so I, I, think, okay. I think you should go first. So I mentioned earlier in the podcast about how tech nuggets have become harder and harder for me. Yes. Okay. So um, interestingly enough, I came into the office this morning. I was like, I need to sit down and find some tech nuggets. What do I got? And I started a conversation with Julie Freed and... Um, she was looking for how to do something. And I was like, Julie, you know how to do this. And she's like, no, I didn't. And in fact, you didn't either. You had 15 steps to do this tech nugget. So I had an alternative method. Yes. I wouldn't say 15 oh, steps. It was the 15 step program to shift Z. Okay, so here is my tech nugget. If you are in your Google Drive and you want your doc or your slides, or your sheets, or whatever, to have a home in two different places. You do not make a copy of your doc. Mm -hmm. You put a placeholder in both. And the way I explained this to Julie, which made her understand, is when you're playing backyard baseball as a kid, you've got six kids to play, so that means three on three. When you're on second base, and it was your turn to bat again, 
you called Ghost Runner. And your imaginary person is on second base and you go to bat. So you're technically in two places at once. That's what Shift Z does. You can have two places at one time, but it's not two copies. So she started calling it the ghost doc. <laughs> that's what she called it. Well, I'm glad you didn't explain it to me that way because I still don't understand. Well, that's because you don't play means. baseball. Correct. Yes. All right. So the way you do this, you go into your drive, you highlight the doc that you want to um, put in a different place. You want it to have a placeholder somewhere else. You um, highlight it. You click shift and Z. And then a little prompt pops up about where you want it to go. So you'll choose like my drive and then choose whatever folder you want it to go to. And it will say, instead of move here, add here. And once you click on the add here, it'll have two little thumbnails in both places. It's original home and it's new home, two places. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Shift C. We don't want to talk about my 15 step plan then? No, God, no. no. It was so confusing. You right click on the document. Oh, okay. Yep. You choose move to, and then on the Mac, you just press the option key and then move change to add. And that's it. No, that's, that's three steps. No, and then you had to back all the way out of the folder that that doc is currently in. You had to back out of your folder, find the new folder. No, it was extra steps. Don't do it. Don't do Don't be Jonathan. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, my first tech nugget is one that I've seen people use before, but if you have oh, yeah. not heard of it recently, and some people mm -hmm. I know have not heard of this one right. because I still find people that haven't seen it before, it's called uh, Yo Teach. Yeah. I need to say that with a bit more attitude. I think so too. I think. Yo, Yo Teach. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is a today's meat replacement. It's right. one of those back channel type of tools. Yeah. And um, it's yourteachapp.com mm -hmm. where you can set up these virtual rooms for um, you and your kids to have conversations or just for kids to have like some group work collaboration conversations together. Right. Um, basically, it's as easy as entering um, a title and description for your room. There is no logins required, which I, I always like for mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Yep. There are some special admin features that will let you do things like uh, you can mute students. You can um, delete messages. You get things like uh, student participation statistics. And you also oh. have the ability to download a transcript uh -huh. of the entire conversation, which I think today's meet used to do as well. Yes, yeah. Um, but it's also got neat things in terms of it can be used on any device. It's got things like a drawing tool where you can like have a whiteboard and you can draw something on whiteboard. Oh, your teacher does? I didn't yeah. know that. And throw that straight in there. Nice. You can also upload photos. And so it's... It's got some kind of padlet -y type of yeah. features on there, too. I need to look at it again. It's also got text-to-speech. Oh. So if somebody types a message, you can sure. click on the speaker, and it will read it aloud But that's for through you. the app, not online. No, that's online. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. Huh. I just sent that tool as a recommendation to someone not that long ago, and I did not know it did all those things. I was like, oh, yo, teach. Do, 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 do. Just tapped away. Well, uh, that's <laughs> kind of the thing. When I, when I went to look at it and play with it for the yep. first time a little while ago, it's... There's not really like a little a help menu or mm -hmm. a how to use your teach. Yeah. You just yeah. have to like click around and find yeah, stuff. Yeah, nice. Okay. Um, so I'll put a video in that I found from the your teach people to uh, the your show teach you people how to use it a little sure. bit. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. So there you go. Your teach. It's right. free and there's no logins and I like it. Okay. So um, my next tech, tech nugget also um, was a result from my discussion with Julie Freed. And she um, she's creating like this path of Google Docs of sorts, right? So um, as we were talking, I'm like, well, one of the things you can do is if you create a bookmark in a doc, every time you create a bookmark in a doc, it generates its own link. Mm -hmm. So you can share that link to that bookmark with someone else. And so once they click on that, it takes them directly to that spot in the Google Doc. So instead of just sh sharing the link to the doc and having them have to thumb through whatever it is you um, want them to see, you can actually share that link with them from the bookmark itself and um, take them directly there. Did you know you could do that? 
you know, I did not know you could do that. Yeah. But, you know, it makes sense that you can because I know you can do that on like a like a website. You can link to specific parts if yeah. you know the HTML or whatever right. that you of that. So it links you halfway down the page instead mm -hmm. of the top of the page and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And I'm looking at the, the support doc you had for that or the, the how to. Yeah. That's from 2013. Yeah, this isn't a new, this isn't new. It's like seven years old and I, I never yeah. thought to do it before. I'm not sure yeah. if I need to do it before, yeah. but I, I like it. Yeah. I think well, I you would know, you can do the same thing for Google Slides. Did you know that? You can direct somebody to a, so each slide yes. within Google Slides has its own link, right? On that. Yes. Yeah. I think in Docs, I've just been doing, because when I create bookmarks, I'll just have like a table of contents or right. something. I do that too. And do it that way too. Yeah. yeah. But she had so many different Docs going in so many different directions, mm -hmm. and she didn't want to recreate her Docs. So I'm like, well, you could just take the link for the bookmark on this Doc and link it to a different Doc instead of right. doing all of this different work and copying and pasting here and there. So do you want to know how to do it? Sure. Okay. So you have to create a bookmark first. And if you've never created a bookmark before, you just go up to insert, insert bookmark. Um, and then uh, when when you have that, there's like a little blue icon that looks kind of like a ribbon bookmark of sorts, right? Okay. So if you go up to that, um, to that ribbon and you right click on the ribbon, it's gonna give you a drop down and it's gonna say like, copy link address or mm. something like that. So you just write, you just click on the copy link address and then you've got it on your clipboard. Mm. Easy, yeah? Yeah, it really isn't yeah. that hard, but something that you wouldn't necessarily know is there, kind of like Shift-Z. Yeah. You know, unless someone else happens to know yeah. how to do it. Cool. Yeah. Okay, I like it. Okay. Your nuggets are hot and fresh today, aren't they? Oh my, can you say that? Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So my last nugget <laughs> is um, a feature I saw from the New York Times okay. called uh, Mentor Texts. So I think this is kind of an interesting option for those upper middle school or high school um, ELA kids who are doing writing because um, Mentor texts, as, as I understand them, are like, you know, example texts where you would analyze um, a text for its its structure and, and how it's written and what the author was, was doing there. And obviously on the New York Times, they have, you know, thousands of different articles from journalists who are writing about all kinds of different things. Right. So they've got this uh, new feature where um, they kind of help you deconstruct some of these articles and help you... Um, look at some of the techniques and the the literary objectives of those things to mm -hmm. to see how and why it was written. So at the start of each text, it has an overview of what the um, text is about, and then it's got some pre-reading kind of questions and things to think about as you go through and read it. And then it starts to pick out some um, specific points that you could have a conversation with your class about or right. why the author wrote it in this way. And um, it links to, you know, the original text for you to look at, as well mm -hmm. as some exa other examples that are, that are um, written in the same way um, from the New York Times. So, Yeah, it's interesting because um, I clicked on your link there and it says, we also hope to incorporate your ideas. If you teach with Times Mentor Text, we'd love to hear what you use and why. Yeah, and they got that little feedback form down yeah. at the bottom where they're, you know, looking to improve this, which I think yeah. is a good thing too. So. Yeah, it is good. Mm -hmm. Good job, New York Times. There you go. All right, so before we go, um, quick shout outs to uh, some listeners who okay. have been uh, mentioning us on Twitter recently. So it would be remiss not to talk about uh, Thomas Hammerland and Rachel Smith and Jonathan Thornton and Mike Mohammed, who I think mm -hmm. we mentioned two weeks in a row now. Oh, so, okay. Yep, yeah, who gave us a mention on Twitter. So not only are they saying they're listening <laughs> to the show, they actually say they like the show. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you have like in capital letters here. Well, That's super funny. I mean, there's a difference between listening to a show and liking a show, mm -hmm. I think. So, yeah. Yeah. There yeah. You go. It's like saying a baby's cute, but you don't really say they're cute. They're like, oh, look at you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way of saying that they're, you know, I'll watch oh, out I see for that you. One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am at Team Carney on Twitter, and Jonathan is at Jonathan Wiley. Our team account is at DLGWAA, and you can use our hashtag at Tech Takeout to tag the show. If you prefer, you can send us an email to podcast at gwaea.org. So until next time. This has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. Mm -hmm.
For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast.